Awesome. Welcome, everyone. So uh, during today's webinar, I'm going to be talking all about the Runaway and Homeless Youth and Trafficking Prevention Act that has been recently introduced. Um, and But just a little bit of housekeeping. Again, for those who have just joined us, um, please introduce yourself in chat, name, pronouns, organization, where you're located, and an emoji to show how your day is going so far. I've seen some smiley faces, some ah, the day's going wild. And I did a party hat. I like the um, the cow person hat. I'm liking that, Eric. So it seems like for the most part, everybody's day has been going pretty good. Maybe a couple of people have had better days. Um, and please, um, we have a lot to cover, um, and I'm going to make sure we have time for Q&A at the end. Also, sometimes I do like to just kind of answer questions as we go. So as you have questions, you can put them in chat, you can put them in Q&A. I have both open. Um, Oh, it looks like Jesse's pretty cold in Seattle. <laughs> you need a blanket, Jesse. Is it like a cold wave going through there? Um, so yeah, please um, introduce yourselves. Please put questions in chat or in q and I will get to them. The PowerPoint slides that you'll be seeing today and this recording are gonna be available on our website. And Eddie's going to um, email it to everybody afterwards as well. Also, there is going to be a survey where we ask you to tell us how we did, how we can improve. Um, please take a few minutes. It's very short. It only takes a few minutes. So please fill out the survey um, at the end of the webinar, and we'll give you the, the hyperlink for that at the end. So with that, let's dive in. I know some folks are still... Still coming in, um, but please, we're doing introductions and chat, just being mindful of time. I'm going to start with giving an overview of the Federal Runaway and Homeless Youth Act program. Then I'm going to talk about what's in the Runaway and Homeless Youth and Trafficking Prevention Act legislation. And then we're going to talk about what is our strategy. Uh, we really only have till the end of the year to try to get this done in this Congress. So I'm gonna lay out what our strategy is and then how you all can get involved because um, we really are gonna need everybody to get involved, reach out. Um, and then there'll be time for questions at the end, but I'll also probably um, answer questions throughout. So with that, I'm gonna dive in because we have a lot to cover. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the National Network for Youth, we strongly believe that no young person should ever experience homelessness. Yet each year, research tells us that 4.2 million youth and young adults do experience homelessness unaccompanied by a parent or legal guardian. And the National Network for Youth is dedicated to preventing and ending youth homelessness in America. We are a membership organization. We do strongly encourage organizations and school districts to become members. It, it does support our work in doing advocacy here in Washington, D.C. We offer unique debt discounts like 25% discount on council on accreditation, discounted consulting fees, discounts on um, registration rates and other events. We do provide baking, breaking policy and practice news, strategic consultation and technical assistance, and our members are eligible to join our uh, National Policy Advisory Committee or to nominate young people to join our National Youth Advisory Council. And our, our membership campaign for 2023 is open. Our membership does run the calendar year, so it goes from January to de December. But if you do become a member today or at any point during the end of the year, you get these few months as a bonus and your membership will go through December of 2023. And um, I actually have a link for membership. I'm gonna drop in the chat. A little bit about our work. Um, we have three main programs, but they are very intersectional. 
So we do federal policy advocacy. So we do work with a network of youth with lived experience. And then obviously our service provider membership network. We work with them to determine what our policy advocacy goals are and also in advocating for policy and systemic change. We do partner with youth with lived experience of homelessness through our National Youth Advisory Council. We invest in mentorship, leadership development. We train in effective advocacy and the policymaking process. And then we partner with them in meeting with federal policymakers to advocate for policy change. And then we do work in communities. It's our place-based work throughout the country. It's our local cross-system collaboratives on youth homelessness, where we really um, help communities center youth with lived experience by creating a youth action board and then bringing together multi-system partners to really identify some goals to prevent and end youth homelessness at the local level. All right, so let's talk about the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. For those of you who may not be familiar, um, we did actually release a policy brief on the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, and you can find that. Um, I don't know, Eddie, if you can put our Runaway and Homeless Youth Act web page, um, if you could put that link in chat. But we did just release a policy brief that has a lot of great information in there and can be really helpful to educate policymakers just about the program. But it became law in 1974 as part of juvenile justice reform. So it's actually Title III of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. The Runaway and Homeless Youth Act uh, last funded amount was 140 million, 140.28 million in fiscal year 2022. That's the highest amount this program has ever been funded at. And it was the last reauthorized in 2018. And that reauthorization didn't make any updates or improvements to the program. It just codified in law that the funding amount for the program should be 155 million. That is just a recommendation for the Appropriations Committee. Appropriators can fund above that or below that. Obviously, they have been funding below that. And the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act is federal money that goes directly to communities to provide services, but then it also does provide funding for some, some national projects, which I'll talk more about. But really since this program came into being in the 70s, it has provided this base funding to communities all across the country to develop community-based responses to youth and young adult homelessness. So the following programs are currently um, funded through the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. So the first three are, those are, that's funding that goes directly to communities, directly to community-based organizations. So the first is street outreach grants that provides education, prevention, treatment, counseling, connection, and referrals to vital services. The purpose of it is to prevent the sexual abuse and human trafficking of street youth or youth at risk of and experiencing trafficking and homelessness. So this funds like your typical street outreach program. It can also fund a drop-in center and different kind of rural youth outreach programs as well. The second program is a basic center program. This is the short-term crisis housing with supportive services for minors. So that is young people under the age of 18. And then there's the transitional living program, which there's kind of the, the typical tr um, traditional transitional living program for young people. That's longer term housing with supportive services for young people 16 to 22. Um, you can be 23. You can stay in up to the age of 23 as long as you're 22 when you enter. But then there's also a maternity group home, which is basically a transitional living program for pregnant and parenting youth. Uh, the question in, um, we got a question. So uh, we don't actually provide any funding. This funding comes from the federal government. Um, so just to kind of flag. And this program is administered by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It sits within the Administration on Children and Families Office. And within that office, it's the Family and Youth Services Bureau. So all the grant opportunities, the funding opportunity announcements are coming out of 
FISB with an ACF at HHS, um, all the alphabet soup. So the fourth funding stream is for the National Communication System. That's 24-7, 365 national phone, text, and online communication systems for youth and families. Also, service providers call as well. This um, is currently being run by National Runaway Safe Line or 1-800-RUNAWAY. And then it also funds National Technical Assistance Center. So that funds training and technical assistance for all of the grantees uh, of the Federal Runaway and Homeless Youth Act program. And this is what is called RITAC, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. So these are just kind of the definitions of youth that are eligible for Runaway and Homeless Youth Act programs. So a homeless youth is defined as an individual for who it's not possible to live in a safe environment with a relative and who lacks safe alternative living arrangements. For the basic center program, that individual needs to be under the age of 18 or an older age if permitted by state or local law. So that means that if you can um, have a state license to provide short-term crisis housing and services to say 16, 17, 18, and 19 year olds, then you would be able to use your basic center programs to serve all of those ages. And then there's for the transitional living program and a maternity group home, a homeless youth needs to be, be between the ages of 16 to 22. And again, if they enter the program before the age of 22, they are able to be a 23 year old in the program. And a runaway youth is an individual under the age of 18 who absents themselves, basically leaves their home or leaves their legal residence at least overnight without the permission of their parents or legal guardians. And then street youth is a runaway or a homeless youth who spends a significant amount of time on the streets in areas that increase um, the risk to such youth for sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, prostitution, or drug abuse. And I should state that these definitions are in current law. The Runaway and Homeless Youth and Trafficking Prevention Act would update some of these definitions. So the, the fourth kind of category of youth is youth at risk of separation from the family. So this is young people under the age of 18 who have a history of running away or whose parent, guardian, or custodian is not willing to provide their basic needs or um, someone who's under the age of 18 who's at risk of entering the child welfare or juvenile justice system as a result of the lack of services available to the family to meet such needs. So this is just a history of how much funding the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act has been appropriated each year by Congress. So you'll see in FY 2018, it was just at 126.2 million and that funded about 675 grants. If you divide that by the 4.2 million youth who experience homelessness in America every year, that's basically just $30 per young person. And then you see the amount has gone from 126.2 million in 2018 to 140 million in um, 2022. And that has made a difference of three more dollars per young person per year, that increase. So what we've been asking for and what's consistent with what's in the legislation that was just introduced is for 369.5 million per year, that would fund about 2,000 grants, and it would increase the per person, per young person um, expenditure per year to 87.9, so almost $88 per young person. That's what we're asking for. So again, all of this is in our policy brief, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I need to keep us moving, but we do have data that shows that Runaway and Homeless Youth Act programs are effective. Um, and this is just some of the data. And there is a FISB map that shows who is currently receiving funding. I will put the link to that um, in chat so you can see 
um, if anybody is currently getting any funding um, through the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act in your state or in your community. Okay, so here it is. So how this, I'm gonna put it in chat. So that's the map. And then I'm also gonna answer it in Q&A. So you would just click on your state and then you would select the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. Um, and then you would see who has that funding. The, this map also includes grantees under the Family Violence and Prevention Services Federal Grant, as well as the Adolescents Pregnancy Prevention Program. So you just have to make sure you select um, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act Program. So let's talk about, so right now what we have is a bill that was introduced. It is not yet law, right? So what these slides are gonna talk about is, when the Runaway and Homeless Youth Trafficking Prevention Act, with all of your help, becomes a law, which means it has to pass through both chambers of Congress with a majority and be signed into law by President Biden, once that becomes a law, these are the changes and improvements that would be made to the existing Federal Runaway and Homeless Youth Act program. So across all Runaway and Homeless Youth Act programs, grants would be for five years. So if you are awarded a grant, you would have it for five years. Uh, you would be notified 90 days in advance of the start of a grant um, that you were either awarded the grant or you were not. It would also establish an appeals process for unsuccessful applicants. And geographic distribution would have to be considered when issuing grants. So this is just making sure that more rural parts of America would be as competitive for these funds as urban parts of the United States. Also, all programs would have to provide training to staff on human trafficking, trauma, sexual abuse, and assaults. And there would be codified into law a very comprehensive mandatory non-discriminatory clause. And that's inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity. Also, instead of calling um, grants um, facilities, they would be called projects. And services would be required to be trauma-informed, age, gender, culturally, and linguistically appropriate. For a street outreach program, it would update language to include youth who have been trafficked instead of saying child prostitution. It would also add the option of using your funds for online and social media methods of outreaching to young people. For a basic center program, right now the length of stay is at 21 days. It would increase that to 30 days or longer as your state law allows. So for example, if you could, I was talking earlier about a basic center program license um, to serve minors. And if you could get a license to serve, to provide crisis housing and services to minors for 90 days in your state, then you could use basic center program funds to house minors for 90 days. So it really would be adding a lot more flexibility based on what your state law, what your state licensing allows. Also, it makes it clear that basic center programs um, that services can be provided to runaway youth, street youth, homeless youth, and youth at risk of separation from their family or at risk of becoming homeless. For the transitional living program and maternity group home, there's um, it, it clarifies that um, people who are identified as family by the youth can be involved in counseling and therapeutic services. So just making sure it's not kind of a narrow um, view on who family is, being only biological. Also, there's a requirement to coordinate services with McKinney-Vento homeless liaisons, and that grantees have to ensure that um, youth know of their eligibility for the free application for federal student aid. And sorry, I should clarify that everything on this page is for transitional living programs, maternity group homes, and basic center programs. Um, so all the bullets on this page apply to both. Um, and grantees can serve a maximum of, a minimum of four youth and a maximum of 20 youth per project. 
unless regulation allows a higher maximum. So what that means is that, again, if you can get a license to house 25 young people and you're complying with state licensing, then that's allowed under the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. Oh, what I, oh, so Lisa, these, um, this is what's in the law. Um, this is what's in the bill. I, I think there's really no opportunity to change anything now because this is what the Senate and the House has introduced um, in a bipartisan, bicameral way. Um, I don't think there's any, I mean, please let me know if there's anything you would change, but this is what's in the bill. And I don't see that changing given the short amount of time we have to get it passed. And then also clarifying that grantees can have mixed project facilities. So with segregated access and programming. So there's been some issues with like, you. the slides are not available yet, but they will be shared afterwards and the recording will be shared afterwards as well. Um, so right now you can have, right now there's some gray area on the number of beds you can have in a building based on regulation. So this would basically fix that. So if you have a 20 bed basic center program, um, a program on one floor to a, or a 20 bed street outreach program on another floor within the same building, this would clarify that that's okay. Marnie, I agree with you in terms of the use of runaway. I think the challenge that we have is that runaway is still a legal term used by the juvenile justice system and status offense, a status offenses in many laws around the country. And in our conversations with juvenile justice advocates, they really want to keep those young people out of the juvenile justice system and to instead ensure they're accessing community-based options. So that's why we still use that um, terminology because we are trying to keep young people out of harmful systems. But I very much uh, do not like that terminology either. It is not a term that we use in our, when we talk about the issue, it's just a terminology in law and regulation. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's where we're coming from. So other things, so specific to the transitional living program and maternity group home, it increases the eligible age to 25. That's at the, that's at the discretion of the applicant. It's not a requirement. Again, there's also the allowable use of providing aftercare purposes, um, aftercare services if possible, and that transition plans need to be written in par partnership with youth. And then there is um, the national communication system. It kind of updates it by um, requiring National Runaway Safe Line or whoever has that contract to assist young people through online and social media. And then for the national training and technical assistance, um, there's the addition of ensuring that training and assistance is provided through on-site and web-based techniques such as on-demand and online learning. So just making sure that virtual is in there somewhere. Um, one thing we added in light of, as a learning from the pandemic, if you will, is the need for some flexibility in the midst of a crisis. So there is like a page of text that was added that, that would give the secretary of HHS the power to waive program requirements in the event of extraordinary circumstances, such as a natural disaster, public health um, emergency or financial crisis. You know, during the pandemic, there was a need to kind of allow young people to stay in programs past the allotted length of stay because people were in lockdown. So there was some very clear needs for some some flexibility in the midst of a crisis. When this bill hopefully becomes a law, then that, that flexibility would be codified in law. And then that is something the HHS secretary could do. And then there is, you know, kind of evaluation, um, you know, would, would have to be every five years if, if you receive a grant. Um, 
and it used to be three, now it's five. That's just kind of updating the three to five. Um, performance standards. So there would be kind of new performance standards that would be issued for the basic center program, transitional living program, maternity group home, street outreach. And then there is a new prevention services program that I'm gonna talk about within one year of enactment and that those performance standards would be integrated into grant making, monitoring, and evaluation. So this is the new kind of update. There has been some challenges with um, grantees being able to provide prevention services to young people or to be able to provide services to young people who aren't accessing housing. Um, and there's there's been a, there's a desire in the field to provide um, prevention services. It's, it's more secondary um, or tertiary prevention, certainly not primary prevention. So this new program, the purpose of it is to prevent youth from running away or becoming a homeless or street youth. Again, it's written that way because homeless youth, street youth, um, are defined in statute. Um, so that's why it's written that way. And to be eligible for a um, prevention services program grant, basically when you're applying for a basic center program grant or a transitional living program grant or a maternity group home grant, you could also apply for an additional 75,000 per year to provide prevention services. And you can, you can ask for less than 75,000 a year, but it's just up to um, 75,000 per year. And um, you have to be successful in your base grant. So you have to be successful in getting your BCP, TLP, or MGH in order to get a prevention services program grant. So nobody would get just a prevention services program grant without being awarded one of the other grants as well. And that priority for this funding, similar to all the other programs, is that for organizations who have experience providing services to runaway and homeless youth, street youth, and youth at risk of separation from family, will get a priority um, in receiving funding. So this is the um, a new definition that's been added for prevention services. So it's very much, and again, this this definition um, was written with our uh, policy advisory committee and our National Youth Advisory Council. Um, and, but it's a very kind of broad list of what service providers could fund with that 75,000 per year. And um, you could get a prevention services program grant with your basic center program and your transitional living program grant. So there is an opportunity to get this additional funding, you know, with all of your other base grants. But it's individual family group peer counseling, family mediation, assessing needs, strengths. Um, so conducting assessments, connecting youth to public services and housing options, emergency respite, um, connecting youth to education and employment programs, case management, resource navigation, um, activities to improve access to local mental health and substance use treatment, um, and prevention. So another kind of new definition is it really clarifies that trafficking refers to um, the definitions of trafficking in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and then culturally and linguistically appropriate um, has the term given culturally and linguistically appropriate by the national standards at HHS. The definitions on this slide are have been in every other um, version of the Runaway and Homeless Youth Trafficking Prevention Act that has been introduced. So it would be new to the law, but it's not new to um, the legislation. I mean, and a lot of the other things I've covered have been in previous iterations as well. Um, this is a big thing that I would say is new. So the amount of funding per year will go up. So if the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act um, is funded at less than 200 million, like it is now, it's funded at 140 million, then the grants um, per year, the grant award amount is 200 to 250,000. 
Now, once Congress funds the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act program at more than 200 million, so they could fund it at 201 million, then the grant awards would go to 225 to 275,000 per year. Again, with that optional additional 75,000 per year for prevention services. And then also um, we put a specific mount in, into law that there should be 2 million um, allocated every three years for a national prevalence study. That's how we got that um, 4.2 million because there was $2 million um, to fund that research. So again, this is just another way to look at the funding. Um, but I would say, look at this yellow column on the right. This is what's in the bill. So um, there's 100 million for the basic center program that would fund about 530. Uh, in FY22, it was funded at 64 million and that funded 313 basic center programs. Transitional living program would be at 125 million. That would fund about 500. Um, and then if you look at in FY22, it was only 56 million and it funded 242. Um, you might question the numbers, but the grant amount would go up. Um, so that's why it's not like 100% translating. Oh no. And then street outreach program was last funded at 20 million. Um, and it would go to 75 million. Someone did ask why street outreach went down. The amount of money that Congress gave street outreach did not decrease. Um, so I, it must have just been a decision with um, how much administrative money HHS would take out and not give out. I'm not sure. Um, the total TLP per MGH is not um, in law. That is or regulation that would be determined by HHS. And then the periodic estimate of 2 million. And then for the prevention services program, the law says um, that would be 67 point, it should be 67.5 million. And that um, is 75,000 times 900. And that's assuming that most basic center program and TLP and MGHs would also want to apply for that additional 75,000 per year. I don't think grants are taxed, but if somebody can, um, I don't think grant funding is taxed. If someone can confirm that in chat, let me know. Um, okay. So let's talk about, I did not know the TLP and MGH um, breakdown. Um, and I don't know how many programs are operating without federal funding, but you can look at tags, um, but yeah, it's confirmed. It is not taxed. Um, Oh, so somebody asked, if this passes, will the current grants change from three to five years? I don't think so. Um, I think that the five-year change would only be for any new funding that happens after this becomes law. These are great questions. Oh, another good question, Marnie. So, the 75,000 prevention services program, again, that opportunity would only be available for new um, BCP, TLP, and MGH, no foes in the future. Um, I don't think that could be added on to an existing grant. I think it would have to be new no foes that would be put out in the future. Hey, keep these questions coming in, I'm liking it. All right, so let's talk about current contacts. What is our strategy? How can you get involved? So for those of you not following politics closely, um, it's a very narrow majority for the Democrats. So the Senate is 50-50. Vice President Harris breaks the tie and goes with the Democrats. So that's how 
the Democrats hold a very, very narrow majority. Um, and then there's also a very narrow majority in the House. So that's why having a bipartisan approach is critical. You're not going to get anything done. You're not going to get anything through without it. Um, so right now, what is Congress focused on? Elections in November. If any of you turn on your TV and watch anything other than, you know, Netflix or Disney Plus, then I'm sure you've seen everybody's commercials. Um, Congress is also going to be working on it, and well, they're already working on an end of year omnibus. An omnibus is just like a big bill. You put everything in. It's a must pass piece of legislation. Uh, also, there's talk of an energy bill. And then um, always, always working on federal funding. Right now we're under a CR, a continuing resolution through December. Um, and so that they'll either need to be another continuing resolution or they will pass a full spending um, bill for fiscal year 2023. So that's what's going on right now. A lot of people are out and campaigning. So this is the process how a bill becomes a law um, for the Runaway and Homeless Youth and Trafficking Prevention Act. Oh, so about back to the Prevention Services Grant. Yes, you can apply for a Prevention Services a Grant for your basic center program and your transitional living program and your maternity group home. So you could in theory have, you know, more than one PSP grant. Yeah. So for us, you know, we we really wanted to hear our members saying, look, we're having a hard time providing prevention services or services only to young people that we're not housing. Can you make that clear? Um, and our policy advisory committee is like, yeah, let's do that and fund it. Right. Like you're severely underfunded. So how can we get you more money to do you know, work that you want to do um, and that, you know, needs to be done? So this is kind of where we are, this chart. And I'm sorry, it's a little fuzzy. Maybe we can send out a higher quality picture of this afterwards. So first you need a bill introduced in the House and the Senate. So what happened on September 30th, um, after 18 months of waiting, is that um, we had champions in the House and the Senate um, a Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate who work together and they introduce identical legislation. So we already have a Democrat and a Republican in the House and the Senate who are co-sponsors of this legislation that would make all of these updates. It's been introduced. They did a joint press release. Um, they actually all issued the exact same press release. Um, and I am going to put a link. Um, I don't know if anybody um, likes to read press releases or um, just have updated information, but this is the blog post we put out with everybody's press releases. So introduction has happened. Um, so the next step is it's, it's referred to a committee. Um, every piece of legislation has a committee that has jurisdiction over it, depending on what federal agency has authority over that bill. Now in the Senate, we are in the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is a little strange because it is an HHS administered program, but because our origin is part of the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, that's why our jurisdiction is within the Senate Judiciary Committee. That's just our history, that's our roots. In the House, the committee with jurisdiction is the House Education and Labor Committee. So we really need each committee to um, review the legislation and to bring the legislation up for a vote within committee, so within a committee meeting. And we need the majority of each committee to vote yay so that it can pass. If we do not get that majority, then um, it will not pass out committee and it's just, it dies. That's um, the terminology. So we need both committees to bring it for a vote, get a yay, and then we need it to somehow get through the full chamber of the House and the Senate. Now in the House, it's much more likely that it can pass um, as part of a bigger package, like just group a bunch of bills moving through that have moved through committee, just put them together, House brings it for a vote and it passes through. 
Now in the Senate, um, it's much more likely that it'll need to get attached to the omnibus or something else, or maybe there's going to be a voterama at the end of the year. And um, we really have to have this as a priority of leadership. Um, and again, that's only after it's passed out of Senate Judiciary Committee. So then if the same bill passes through both chambers through Whatever means necessary, that's where we are, whatever means necessary, whatever is moving, attach it, pass it. Then it goes to um, the president, it's signed, it becomes law. And then we get to work on implementation, right? So that's kind of the pathway. So now we're gonna get a bit more into strategy. So like I said, it was introduced um, on the 21st. Um, these are the champions. Senator Leahy is our Democrat from Vermont. Senator Collins is our Republican from Maine. In the House, we have Chairman Yarmouth um, from Kentucky and then Representative Bacon from Nebraska. Now, to note, both of our Democrats are actually retiring. Um, and so we lose our Democratic champions starting next year. And we're going to, um, we're starting to work on new champions. But just to make clear, that they really are um, signaling to the committees with jurisdiction that this is a legacy issue for them. They really want to get this passed before they retire. So that's why we're really pushing and, and feel like there's a real chance here to get this done. So our current ask is that every member of the US Senate, every US House representative should co-sponsor this legislation. So right now, you can reach out to your elected officials, both your U.S. representatives and your House representatives, and ask them to co-sponsor this legislation. And then the next kind of ask is that this legislation becomes a priority of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the House Senate and Labor Committee. It's a priority. We're asking you to bring it for a vote and make sure it passes. That's really what we need to happen. So this is the strategy. So we need, the more co-sponsors we have on the legislation in the House and the Senate, which you do this through reaching out, having a meeting, writing emails, making phone calls. The more co-sponsors we get, the more likely it is we are gonna get a vote in committee and that we are gonna get a vote um, on the floor or get it attached and somehow passed through each chamber. So the Senate Judiciary Committee, we need one Republican from the Senate Judiciary Committee to co-sponsor the legislation. And on my next slide, I have the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. But if I have to have one Republican on committee as a co-sponsor for it to be brought for a vote within committee. And then we need um, Chairman Durbin. He is chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, a Democrat from Illinois, and the ranking member, Chuck Grassley, the Republican from Iowa, to bring the bill for a vote within the committee. It needs to pass. Then we need Majority Leader Schumer, a Democrat from New York, to bring it for a full floor vote or to make sure it gets attached to the omnibus or whatever is moving. That's what we have to have happen in the Senate. In the House, we need as many co-sponsors as possible from the House Ed and Labor Committee, um, as many Republicans as we can get. Um, and we need the chair of the House Ed and Labor Committee to bring the bill for a vote. He's the Democrat from Virginia. I did not include the ranking member, um, Virginia Fox, here to bring it for a vote, vote because she won't. She doesn't believe in any federally funded programs. She would never support this program just because by principle, she doesn't believe in federal funding. So don't waste your time with Virginia Fox. She would never do anything to help make any federally funded program pass, become law, improve, nothing. Uh, and then we really need Speaker Pelosi to make it a priority, bring it to the full floor for a vote, attach it to whatever, get it through. Okay, so this is the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, and obviously we want as many Democrats, as many Republicans as possible. 
I will tell you, it is not going to be easy to get a Republican to co-sponsor because of the funding amount um, and then because of the non-discrimination clause. And in particularly, because it includes LGBTQIA plus youth. So if any of you are on this call or on this webinar and you're from Iowa, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, Nebraska, um, I guess we could try Holly, M Missouri, Arizona, Louisiana, North Carolina. I don't think Blackburn, I mean, Tennessee. But if anybody is from those states and we identified Nebraska and North Carolina as the most likely. So if you're from Nebraska or North Carolina in particular and Iowa, um, I would love to do, um, to work with you to do some Hill meetings to target those particular Republicans. Um, okay, so that's this committee. And um, Eddie is gonna uh, download these slides and make them a PDF and, and share the link with you all. And so then this is the House Ed and Labor Committee. And again, you can look um, to see you know, are any of these folks from your states? And we do actually have a legislator lookup tool on our website. So if you are not sure um, who your legislator is or what, um, okay, Mary, let's coordinate because he is, I, I don't know if Bacon can help get SAS on because Bacon is our Republican in the House from Nebraska. So I just put a link um, where you can find your representatives and often different service providers, their area uh, that they serve for youth. It might be a couple of house representatives. Please meet with both and both your senators. Um, and really, we really need as many co-sponsors in a short amount of time by like November 7th um, is what I was told. We really need to show a good um, a good showing in terms of support for this program. Yeah, Mary, let's do that. Send me an email if you can, and we can coordinate. I mean, unfortunately, a, a question about Washington D.C. I mean, your representatives you know, your representative is not that persuasive, and she's not on this committee. I don't think it hurts to reach out to her. Um, obviously, she's an incredible support for this program, but politically, um, I don't think it's it's going to help unless, you know, she can be persuasive with Pelosi, right, um, in terms of really getting this program or really getting this bill for a, um, a vote. From the Republican side, um, you know, I think Thompson is gettable. Stefanik had been on. I, I don't know. Um, she's kind of shifted a bit. Um, Fitzgerald, Letlow maybe, um, steals a possibility. Yes, Cawthorn in North Carolina. Oh, I need to double check that, Marnie. I'll get back to you. Um, McLean, maybe, in Michigan. Um, but anyhow, uh, anybody and everybody on committee, off committee, all of your representatives, ask them to co-sponsor. That's really kind of where we are. Um, so these are some talking points. Obviously, you know your programs. You know, you know what is... Um, beneficial to the politicians you're speaking with. But for us, it's really helpful to make things local, right? So to talk about, you know, the the issue in the state, if it's a state representative, it's if it's a U.S. House representative, this is the need, the vast, you know, this is the amount of need in, in your congressional district. This is what we're currently able to meet, um, the need, like just a portion of the current need. The runaway and passing the Runaway and Homeless Youth Trafficking Prevention Act would increase funding 
to our community would increase our ability to meet the need. And we know investing in young people is smart for the community. It saves taxpayer dollars. It gives young people opportunities. You know, it breaks generational cycles, you know, all of those kind of different talking points. So use your local data, use your numbers. We know that the amount of funding authorized would more than double. So, you know, you can estimate a doubling of investment um, within your community based on the, the over doubling of investment, you know, in the federal program. You can make those arguments. The, these um, talking points are from a more national, you know, level. So that's why we always encourage you to pull your local, your state numbers. You know, 4.2 million young people experience homelessness on their own every year. That's one in 30, 13 to 17 year olds and one in 10, 18 to 25 year olds. We have applied that to state census data. So if any of you are looking for like state data and kind of using the Chapin Hall research at a state level, um, you can email me. We can um, we can share that information because we have it in a Google Sheets. Um, and then just say how vital the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act programs are to scaling up youth-centric community responses and just how, you know, how important it is for young people to have a longer length of stay, for grantees to get more money per year, the prevention services program, um, how these programs do prevent human trafficking and also provide services to survivors of human trafficking. You know, I think, um, members of Congress, and in particular, Republican members of Congress are very interested in um, preventing human trafficking and, and helping survivors of human trafficking. So that can be very persuasive to members of Congress. Um, and then how, you know, increasing the age for transitional living programs, if that's a need you see in your community to really, um, to really highlight that. I am putting my email in chat so we can I can get you that kind of census labeled data. So this is just, you know, there is very strategic ways to meet with your elected officials. You want to tug at their heartstrings, share a story, have young people with lived experience, share their experience, why the runaway and homeless, you know, why these programs are important, how they made a difference in their life. You never want them to trauma share or harm, you know, overshare or re-trigger themselves. Um, but you can share stories of young people you have served. Um, you want to engage the mind. You want to connect the dots between the story and the issues um, and why it's important for the policymaker to take action, provide practical and relatable information. And then also politically, like, how will this benefit that elected official politically? And that's why talking about the need for youth in your community, how this does save taxpayer dollars, what's the cost to society for not helping young people. And that's where you might wanna um, play up human trafficking if that's persuasive to your policymaker. And then I think also, you know, there's research that shows, you know, up to 40% of chronically homeless adults were first homeless under the age of 25. So if they're very invested in ending chronic adult homelessness or visible street homelessness among adults, then they should be supportive of preventing and ending youth and young adult homelessness because that does prevent and end chronic adult homelessness. And importantly, remember that you are powerful. Your lived experiences, if you are a young person with lived expertise or your expertise as a service provider or concerned community member should be shaping the policies that are created. Your elected officials do not know what you know. You are the expert. So lean into that power and that expertise in doing your advocacy and speaking your truth to power. We do have toolkits. We have resources. We have a virtual advocacy toolkit. You can schedule all these meetings, do them from home over Zoom or Google Meet. If you can't go in person, we have a very broad policy agenda. If anybody's interested and wants to know more about us, we are hosting our summit and Hill Day in March 2023. It's going to be at the Hyatt in Washington, D.C., as well as virtual. Early bird registration is open now, and our summit is HUD approved, so you can use your HUD administrative funding to pay for the cost of attending. We do offer consulting, so if you need help 
uh, starting Youth Action Board, improving Youth Action Board. We do trainings on adultism and other types of support. If you need any support, you can always fill out a consultation request form on our website and we'll have a meeting with you to see if there's anything we can do to provide. We do have a certificate on human trafficking program at Arizona State University with the McCain Institute. And then for Y members do get a 20% discount. And it is an on-demand kind of go at your own pace, two different courses. And they are, um, they do, you do get CEUs um, through the National Association of Social Workers. Please consider becoming a member. Here's my email again. Um, what other questions does anybody have? Is virtual free? Virtual advocacy? Yes. So, um, and sometimes members of our, you know, members of Congress and their staff, they'll just want to have a phone call. Um, if, you know, if you're not going to go in person, so it's not always a video call. So I think do whatever you can um, to have the meeting. Our website does have a lot of um, like draft agendas um, here. And we have, ad I'm going to put this link in here. These are our advocacy resources. Um, there's like draft agendas, um, different talking points. There is, um, if you do have an advocacy meeting, please report back, let us know. I always like to do follow-up. And we are hopefully going to be hosting a day of action in a few weeks. And I'll be sharing that information out with everybody who hasn't already reached out to their elected official. And if you can take action today, um, and you can fill out this form and send an email right now to both your U.S. Senators and your House Representative. And then I would recommend um, that you also um, reach out, um, make a phone call, or if you already have contacts with your elected officials, send them an email and ask for a meeting and ask for them to co-sponsor the Runaway and Homeless Youth Trafficking Prevent Prevention Act. In the Senate, it's S4916, and in the House, it is HR8498. And I will also put that in chat. Oh, the question, yes. So no, there is a very discounted um, summit registration fee for those who are attending virtually. Um, and then it's more money, obviously, for those who are in person because hotels are crazy expensive and we have to pay for a lot of AV and um, food and beverage fees. So it, it's more expensive for in person just because of the hotel costs. And it is, um, we also offer um, virtual group viewing. So there are some programs in schools that are going to buy a virtual group ticket and then folks are going to get together in the same room in their community to tune in live um, to our summit. So that's a new option this year. And then we do have in-person, if you're a group, then you can get discounted registration. And then obviously our members pay a discounted rate, but the cheapest rates are available now during early bird and Eddie put um, the registration link in chat. All right, well, thank you all. I hope um, I answered everybody's questions. If not, you have my email. Everybody will be getting these slides and a link to the recording. Afterwards, please fill out the survey, which is also in chat. I'm happy to stay on if anybody has um, any more questions, but I think I got to them all. And thank you so much for being here.